So what, what are the very obvious manifestations of equity, uh, inequity that we see in society? Uh, the very obvious ones that we know of are that assets are inequitably distributed, right? I mean, across social groups. So across this, I mean, whether it is the whole question of knowledge, hmm? I mean, who is articulate, who is able to, uh, whether academically or otherwise, engage in conversations, engage in debates, uh, be part of the process of knowledge making, is also very much determined by where you are and who you are, right? I mean, I'm not saying that every, every person in a particular caste is at the same level, obviously because there are different kinds of inputs that are also going into the making of people. But if you look broadly across social groups, you would find very, very strong inequities which uh, are easily sort of observable in the context of access to assets, to knowledge, to rule-making processes. Hmm? Who decides? Who actually makes the rules? Who makes the policies? Uh, decision making, whether it is the micro unit of a household or whether it is a state level or a national level policy, uh, you, you definitely see that certain groups are deliberately left out of these processes and to do so, I mean you cannot just say that you are left out, right? There are very, there's a very conscious use of different instruments or institutions to ensure that certain people are left out of these processes. Now, we discussed these institutions that you have certain sets of norms for women. Hmm? You have certain sets of norms for certain uh, caste groups. Who is allowed to access? For example, in a village context, uh, there's a very clear understanding of this is a well, this is a village well, and who can actually go there and draw water. Hmm? So it's, an, it's a very unstated sort of a uh, norm. Okay, it, it's not, it's definitely now not part of the law where you are talking about equal access. But it is that norm which still very much guides how uh, resources will be distributed. So each of these institutions play a very critical role in terms of accessing uh, resources and actually being part of rule making and decision making processes. Uh, the one thing which in fact uh, very, uh, needs to be understood is that often when we look at uh, any sector, whether it is water, land, one of the first things that comes out as a solution is uh, distribution, right? Redistribution of assets. Now, uh, that of course in itself is a fairly radical agenda. Uh, there are two, two sort of common solutions that come out. One is redistribution and the other is representation. Hmm? So we have these 33%, 50% reservation on committees, on lawmaking bodies or whatever. And that resource should be equitably shared. Now, these are certainly very important sort of uh, components or solutions as part of addressing some of these inequities. But what is often not discussed and which is, uh, which in my opinion is very important is that it's not only a matter of distribution, uh, which feminists have been arguing for very long, that why this separation? Hmm? Finally, if the family did not do that entire reproductive work, and by reproductive work we would mean uh, bearing children, taking care of those children, taking care of the old, uh, looking after the ill in the house. All of this falls in the realm of what is seen as reproductive work. But if all of that was not done, imagine if all of that was not done, hmm, do you think you would have a productive labor power that works on the fields, that goes to factories, or that works in the service sector? Do you think that was at all possible? So would you treat that as simply non-productive work, right? You would? No, you wouldn't. Huh? Most productive work, but it's all unpaid and free labor, right? So, and not recognized work either. So it's all part of the, again, a system where it's all there. So uh, there has been a lot of debate around this actually. And uh, in fact, uh, in 70s, there was a very strong struggle uh, and Italy was like the center of that uh, movement where uh, they actually spoke about uh, monetizing and getting a payment or a salary for uh, this kind of work. So that actually led into several debates in terms of how you look at uh, productive work and how you look at work which falls in the realm of uh, nurture, culture, etc. 
And one of the uh, stronger arguments was that, as you said, I mean, in fact, that by monetizing it, you are actually again laying the burden on the woman herself. And you are not actually talking about reorganization of labor. So you are uh, not talking about division of labor, you're not talking about sharing of labor. So the work that should not really be that of a woman, right? I mean, why should it be only women's work? Apart from bearing the child for nine months, uh, anything after that should be a concern of uh, people who are part of that entire process. So the idea is that you uh, quantify it, yes, to understand the enormity of the work that women put in but not really uh, find a solution which is so sort of reductionist in its uh, way that you only say, okay, if we pay a salary, we are done. But it's not even, then the question doesn't stop at the payment of a salary, but who pays that salary, right? So there are a whole lot of issues that do come up. But the demands then, alternative demands were that, you know, uh, look at working hours as six hours for everyone, so that that work, which is otherwise considered as unpaid and reproductive work, becomes a shared family responsibility or a shared household responsibility where men also have the time out of their sort of, you know, the typical 12-hour, uh, 14-hour work schedules, they also have the time to engage with uh, families and the household sort of chores. So that was also one of the... But it, it is an unresolved uh, question. And Venezuela was one country where Chavez, in fact, uh, brought this into law and he said that all female headed households uh, who are not engaged in uh, employment outside of the house will get a salary uh, from the state. So this was implemented, I'm not too sure if the scheme still continues now, but so this, this is the same argument that was used is that you know, there is a lot of productive work that goes into it and it should be paid for. So this was specifically for female headed households. So. So there, are, there could be interesting debates around that, but the point here is that uh, what we were talking about is that it's not simply the solutions that we often find are either improve access or uh, bring in representation. And whereas those are important, there is little discussion that happens around how uh, systems of work and how labor is organized around those uh, activities is actually reorganized. Hmm? So this uh, kind of a uh, division that we see, you know, that the family remains the domain of the woman and any work that is outside becomes the domain of the man hmm? is, is a dichotomy that actually needs to be cracked somewhere and that all of this is productive work needs to be recognized. Unfortunately, earlier, earlier societies did not have this kind of a system, right? I mean, you had a farmhouse where women were laboring in the farm and there, was, there were a lot of collective activities that happened as part of the household. But this has changed in the capitalist mode of production where you increasingly see that there is a very strong divide that a workplace is very segregated from what you call as your domestic or family space. So unless all of that is challenged, or at least you have a movement, I mean movement in the sense, a way forward that looks at the larger picture, I think we would still remain, our solutions would unfortunately still remain in the realm of what the state can do in terms of um, bringing more women uh, into the visible space, but not really challenging the work they do, the, the work that needs to be recognized, and the way that your entire production systems are organized. So that, that's of course the goal that we have, right? I mean, are we looking at it as a macro picture? Or are we going to largely dabble with the micro that is there before us? So that's a question that we definitely need to uh, bring on board. Now, broadly, if you look at the context of water, uh, what we saw in the morning also, I mean, uh, Joy, spoke about various issues of inequities in terms of water conflicts uh, that uh, were discussed, that there are questions of where you're located in terms of the disadvantage or advantage, whether it is a watershed or whether it is a command area of a canal, whether you're at the head or tail end, whether you're in a state that is advantages or not, so interstate, transboundary, inter-country, issues, all of these are issues that are related to locations. But in each of these locations also, what we need to understand that there is a social dynamics that is also at play. We'll see that a little later. 
and the other kind of inequities that we sort of see in the water sector are broadly around sectoral allocation. So if we were to broadly uh, look at inequities in the water sector, uh, can we say that they are broadly around social groups, sectoral allocations and locations? Uh, is that fair enough or do you think I've missed out something which is very big and uh, cannot be sort of broadly got into these broad categories? So in terms of social groups, I think we are clear. I'll first go to the examples, okay. So if we look at locations, I think what broadly uh, locations would cover is this kind of dynamics where you have the urban peri-urban kind of conflicts, you have the rural urban conflicts, uh, you have the head and tail reaches within a command area, within the larger command area for project as well as within uh, smaller miners. You have the upstream downstream conflicts. You have uh, people who benefit from surface irrigation projects who are part of these command areas through a huge public investment and those who never can really be part of these command areas. Uh, these would be broadly examples from say locations. Uh, sectoral allocations would largely be uh, and, and of course, as I mentioned in the locations, you also have examples of interstate and transboundary issues, which I have not brought into my discussion right now. But in sectoral allocations, you would broadly have the different sectors hmm, in which uh, ecosystem is something that I have not added. Yes. So industry versus agriculture, you have industry, domestic, agriculture versus domestic. So all of these kind of how sectoral allocations do create contestations and conflicts is one kind of inequity uh, that we are seeing in uh, and, and ecosystem flows. These are broadly what I would say as you know categories but social groups is, is something that actually intersects with both these. Hmm? So social groups could very well be uh, the caste that you belong to, the ethnic group, the religious community that you belong to, women as a category, the third gender as a category. So there are various groups that have a position of advantage or disadvantage and which do have uh, does have a very strong impact in terms of how you are able to access different resources. So broadly that's the kind of uh, uh, examples I would put in the context of water. We can really discuss it out if we feel that this is not uh, a broad enough or not does not encompass the kind of contestations or inequities we are looking at. So uh, what the point is that uh, we cannot really look at these three in an isolated manner. Hmm? When we, now we've had a discussion around how social groups uh, play out in terms of the disadvantage they pose and how different institutions are in fact created so that the status quo uh, remains or in fact uh, is aggravated. Uh, so when you look at inequities in the water sector, whether it is because of locations or whether it is because of sectoral allocations, the group that they belong to also has a very strong role to play in how the contestation plays out. So the point is that all are intersecting with each other. You cannot miss out on the social disadvantage if you are looking at, say, a rural-urban issue. Hmm? Because the rural-urban itself becomes such an overwhelming issue for you that you stop looking at groups who are actually being affected. Hmm? or stop looking at women who are actually very differentially impacted by the conflict that is taking place, say, uh, because more water is allocated to industry and uh, actually there was a lot of dependence on uh, agriculture. But there's a differential impact that you would see on women of a farming household. So here the point is that you cannot really see these in isolation from each other.